Okay. Hi, uh, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is uh, Purna Kalare. I work as a system architect for a, a group within Philips called uh, Connected Digital Platforms and Propositions. So, uh, yeah, we're in the Netherlands. I hope I don't have to explain too much what Philips is or uh, what Philips does, right? So, uh, we're a 125-year-old company, been doing products and uh, uh, things like light bulbs and TVs and radios for, for a long uh, time. Uh, but the past few years, Philips has been going through a major transformation, right? So we are um, focusing more and more on healthcare, uh, really becoming a health technology kind of company. And in that context, uh, the group that I work for, Connected Digital Propositions and Platforms, is, uh, has been working on building a, a platform that enables uh, the uh, that enables Philips to actually become a health tech company, really manage all the data that we have and deliver a good amount of value to the users. So what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, uh, the, the few slides is um, some of the trends uh, that we have seen, which has led us to think in this direction. Uh, also, why did we actually start making a platform? What are the major uh, concerns or learnings that we have seen while starting to build this platform? Yeah? As we said earlier, if there's questions anywhere, please just ask. To start with, uh, there's a few trends uh, that probably most of you are aware of, but would like to reiterate that are driving this transition. So connected digital products, right? And we're talking in the IoT tracks. Uh, so it's obvious. Everything is now connected. Yeah. So connectivity is, is, is kind of a given. If you buy a device that cannot really connect either via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi to another mobile or something and to the internet, that's simply not possible. Everything that you look at has to be connected. And the second uh, real thing that made this happen, uh, because I also remember it was uh, six or seven years ago, if you actually made an internet connected TV or a device like that, the big discussion was always, how do you control that device, right? Uh, was it the remote control? Do you build a specific tablet that does that? The control point was a big discussion. The coming of mobile solved that problem, right? So everybody has a mobile device. And the mobile devices are always connected. So basically, you have a control point for IoT devices by default. Yeah, so there, there is a control point. And then the third big trend is the coming of cloud with scalable data storage, processing, and analytics. Uh, we cannot underestimate this uh, simply because what it means to build uh, a big infrastructure has changed significantly with the coming of the cloud. Earlier, you would have to be a huge company to set up a data center or hire a mainframe or whatever. And now with things like Amazon Web Services, anybody can start uh, uh, whipping out an instance of the cloud and start doing things. Yeah. Now with these things happening, uh, the nature of a product has fundamentally changed. So uh, especially for a company like Philips. In the past, when we made a TV or a DVD player or something else, you made a product, you really tested it, a box, pro put it in the box, put it on the shelf, and sold it, and then it was done. Right and people would buy it and use it. Uh, and the purpose for it, for which it was built was fully tested before you put in the market, and it was done. But what you see now is that a digital product is by default just a small piece in a, in a big puzzle. Yeah? So if you build a product, you need to build an application around it. You need to build some services around it. Uh, you, and because you do all of this, uh, it's difficult to bundle the cost of all these services into a product, so you need to make sure that you're constantly leveraging the data that you have and making something out of it. And again, if you make a mobile application, the ecosystem around you is always changing, right? So if you, uh, there's a new version of iOS, there's a new version of Android that is not controlled by us, but the users expect your app to continue working, you have to constantly make updates. That has to keep happening. And all of this, means a very, very fundamental change in the way uh, a lot of product companies do business. So it's no longer about making a product, putting it in a box, and shipping it out. It's all about building a, building a proposition around it in which uh, the product is just one piece. Yeah? And that's, uh, that's why we call a proposition here within Philips. So basically, it's hardware, software, and services all interconnected by data 
and digital content that deliver a meaningful uh, solutions. So this is, this is something that's happened in the product landscape in general. And then if you look at healthcare, uh, the same trends that uh, draw the change in the product are also leading to what we call the democratization of healthcare. Traditionally, healthcare, when, within Philips, when we said healthcare, it was these uh, big machines. You had scanners, x-ray machines, things that went into the hospitals, only experts could look at them, and so on. And that was healthcare. Consumers had nothing to do with healthcare. But what you see now is everybody has a wearable, right? Uh, there people want to discuss, uh, uh, people have sensors, people want to know what is going on with them, and healthcare is no longer limited to hospitals. People have a lot of data, they want to use that data in the hospitals outside, and they want to constantly know how well they're doing, are they doing well, and what's going on. And this means that, uh, yeah, healthcare is no longer limited just to the big IN devices and to hospitals. So these two trends together enable what we like to call the health continuum. Yeah, so basically you have, uh, again, if you go back to, if you look at what we do, we span an entire spectrum from when you're born all the way till you yeah, more or less die. So basically we call it uh, from the womb to the tomb. So we have products that do pregnancy, and as soon as you're born, you have devices where baby cameras and so on, uh, and then uh, you have your wearables to which, which help you track your fitness and prevention, and then if you go into a hospital, you have all these X-rays and MRI machines and so on, and then you have treatment devices, and finally, if you're, an, if you're old and if you need home care, you also have devices that can do uh, fall detection, uh, look at your wellness, and so on and so forth. And if you look at the amount of data that this uh, provides and the, the opportunities that this gives, it's amazing, right? Uh, you basically don't have to wait for somebody to fall sick or you don't have to uh, only treat people on conditions. You can actually follow them through their life uh, with the consent, whatever, uh, but really understand and deliver value uh, for the person. So uh, it, it can help a consumer understand who he is and deliver a value all the way through. But to do this, there are a few basic things that need to be in place, right? So like I mentioned, although we, we, uh, there are products in all these spaces, typically they're all built in their own silos. So uh, the, the event guys are out there building their baby bottles, the x-ray guys are building their x-rays, and somebody is building a health watch. And if I import the data from a health watch uh, onto, my, onto a phone or something, and then I go into the hospital for an x-ray, they don't even know that I'm the same person, right? unless you solve the problem of having a co one identity for the user across all of these uh, segments, then you don't have a health continuum. That's one. And the second big challenge is data. Again, if unless all of this data across the spectrum lands in one data store somewhere where you can actually compare, correlate, analyze, do all of these things, then you have nothing, right? Because everything is again siloed. So that's the uh, so that's 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 a bit the context from where we are coming. So we we have these uh, trends. We have this ambition to go into the health continuum. How do we solve this problem? And the way we thought of doing that is to actually build a platform which can support solve some of these things and support the entire health continuum. So I will talk about uh, how we approach that going forward. So before diving into the building blocks and what the platform is, right? I want to quickly show, uh, yeah, we said that a device is just a small part of a solution. I just want to show what a typical solution looks like these days, right? So again, Avent is a part of Philips that does mother and child care. Uh, so you, they make baby bottles and temperatures and so on. But now if you look at the biggest project that we're working on with an Avent, it's a software project, which is basically a kind of application that allows parents to, uh, to keep track of how their children are doing. Uh, so they can either do that manually by just entering how well you're sleeping and so on, but also with a bunch of IoT devices that connect to it. Yeah, we have, uh, we have a baby camera that connects to it, which can detect whether your baby is sleeping or awake, in and out of bed. There is a uh, thermometer uh, that connects to it, which again transfers all of this data via Bluetooth to the app and so on. 
But the interesting bit here is beyond the connectivity. Uh, what we try to do is once you get this data in the application, the application has to store all of these observations, uh, process that data, do something interesting with it, and give back uh, some personalized recommendations to the user. And personalized is kind of the key part, right? So if I just uh, send the same article to everyone, or if I just show the same um, uh, advice to everyone, it doesn't make sense. So what you need to do is really look at the data, make sense of it for that specific person or for that specific BP, and give some feedback. Yeah. And this, this, is, this is kind of a proposition that we're looking at. And you can do this at almost every level, right? So I was talking about the baby care stuff. Uh, but if you start looking at things like toothbrushes, uh, you could do the same. You could have sensors in there, uh, which, are, which gathers a lot of data. You could actually provide guidance to the user on which parts of the mouth that they're not brushing well on. Uh, is, is, uh, is it working? Is it not working? How long do you brush? All of these kind of things. And the interesting bit here is, uh, although this looks like a simple application, this is actually medical. Yeah? So when we say medical, uh, it basically means that this is classified as a medical device because it's getting data from uh, uh, the uh, data from something like a thermometer, which is a class uh, two medical device, and then you're processing that and giving back advice. So this entire system is classified as medical and is hence filed with the FDA and so on as a medical device. Yeah. Now, if you go a level deeper into what it takes. Uh, to build an application like this? First of all, like I mentioned, this is, uh, this is medical, right? So there's an entire group of, uh, yeah, within research or scientists or whoever else, who are actually looking at all the data uh, out there and coming up with meaningful correlations, yeah? So like, like I said, you, you have a lot of IoT devices. So for example, we have uh, an air purifier, right? Which is, a, so these days, the quality of the air is a big deal in uh, China. A lot of people have air purifiers. And then we have, uh, you have a baby camera, which can measure how the baby is sleeping. So what could be interesting is to see, hey, is there actually a clinically provable connection between the uh, air quality in your room and how well your baby is sleeping? So we have people who actually uh, do research on that, look up the literature, clinical trials if needed, et cetera, et cetera, and come up with a kind of rule saying, if the, air, if the uh, CO2 concentration in the room goes beyond a certain value, then the baby sleep, uh, the baby does not sleep well. Yeah? And once you come up with something like that, you actually have to write down uh, content in a way that makes sense to a specific uh, user who's listening to it. Uh, how do you want to explain it? You have to define a rule uh, that, uh, that triggers this thing. So basically what happens is you're getting in a lot of data from the air purifier, and at a certain time, if you see that the, uh, the value of the CO2 concentration is going too high, then you want to trigger a rule to give them feedback. And then uh, you have to have the application which actually gives this feedback to the user, right? So this, 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 this whole system is what you need to build up a digital proposition. Before going a bit further, so that's, uh, that was background to say what is the kind of uh, propositions we're looking to address and the problem that we're solving. Uh, a couple of uh, special th things that make it more challenging in the medical arena, and that's about this medical device classification, right? So if you build a medical device uh, like, the, like you grow, it's no longer just an application, simply because uh, the moment you say something is medical, it is heavily regulated. Uh, and you need to have all kinds of documentation and classification, et cetera, and filing. So the first thing that happens there is uh, you have this process called, uh, yeah, you need to do a risk analysis of every, any proposition that you build to say which medical class does it belong to. And that always starts with something called the intended use. Yeah? So you have to declare saying, this is a device, so if you build a thermometer, say this is a device that is intended to diagnose the uh, temperature of a baby within a tolerance of a certain value and uh, diagnose if he has a fever. If you say that, and then you have to actually start saying, okay, there are these are the components that this thermometer contains, and this requirement or the claim that you have maps to these various components in this way, 
because of which uh, we then end up with the classification class A, B, or C. Class A is uh, no injury. Uh, if, if the device goes bad, no injury or, uh, is possible. So uh, typically what you see is a number of these applications uh, that we have fall under class A. So simply because uh, if you say, I'm importing data from a thermometer, uh, and somehow the thermometer shows uh, the data in the mobile application goes wrong, uh, it doesn't show the right temperature, is that cause for serious injury or non-serious injury? Right? And that's the kind of discussion that you need to have with, with the experts. And they, usually they say, no, if you just show, uh, if the display is wrong, uh, it's usually not cause for serious injury because the parents are still looking at the baby and they know that he isn't doing well, et cetera, et cetera. And any parent who purely looks at a mobile and doesn't see that his baby is not doing too well, isn't doing great parenting. So that's usually falls under class A. But then you have uh, other devices like in class B where you really use them for diagnosis, and if they misdiagnose something, then there's possible for non-serious injury. And then you have class C, which is uh, uh, where you can really have uh, people dying if something goes wrong, right? And a typical example is an X-ray machine if, you, if the amount of exposure is uh, not right, and if you deliver too much uh, of X-ray, then you can cause serious injury. These are the categories. And this is, becomes extremely interesting when we go further into the platforms that we're building, because if you start building uh, if, if you're building various building blocks that you want to pick and choose and compose into a proposition, uh, then what classification do you build that with? Right? Because uh, uh, different propositions will have different categories, and uh, when your component goes into that, you need to make sure that it fits the specific category. So that's a pretty interesting challenge. And the next one is uh, personal data. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, some of you were here for... Uh, Ruben's talk before, but personal data is extremely important. And uh, if you look at the classification of personal data, we have uh, uh, anything that can identify a person is personal data, so including IP addresses, by the way. So that's always interesting. So if you're collecting uh, data, if you're actually logging the uh, IP address from where a request is coming from, you're still collecting data. So for regulatory reasons, you have to say you, you have to declare that you're collecting personal data and actually abide by all the laws and regulations. And then the moment you have something like ethnicity, race, sexual preference, or anything to do with health, that is sensitive personal data. And sensitive personal data always has to follow uh, uh, really stringent regulations. And these are things like uh, Sensitive personal data in a number of cases cannot leave a country where, you are, uh, where the data was collected. So if there's a consumer in uh, uh, France for whom you're collecting a certain amount of data, there are regulations that say that that data has to reside within the country. So if you actually have a cloud deployment in the US, then you're not allowed to send data for a European consumer over there. And then you have things like China, which has its own set of regulations, Russia, et cetera, et cetera, and those bring in extremely uh, interesting uh, uh, implications. And on top of that, uh, the, uh, it, it's, not just about the, uh, it's not just about how and where you stir. It's also about whether the user has consented to the type of data that we're collecting. And does he really understand what we're using it for? Does he give informed consent to it? Yeah? So uh, a couple of slides here, I'll go through that quickly, but basically the, the, the whole idea is that whenever you're collecting any kind of personal data, you need to make sure that the user really understands what data he's giving up and why, and gives explicit consent. And we also have to ensure that you actually record the consent from the user very well, so that if you have, uh, for regulatory reasons, this has to be clearly recorded and kept somewhere. So that's a uh, slightly long context, basically, uh, saying all the challenges and the context that led us to creating a platform. So uh, yeah, and then that we, we, start, uh, we, we thought that it's an interesting idea to actually uh, build a platform simply because these are issues that are faced by different parts of the company, different propositions again and again. And you could uh, solve it once and solve it by, by building a platform. The important things there is you have one, uh, one point for user identity and authorization. Uh, consistent brand expression, 
So we also don't want every application that Philips builds looking very different. Uh, we have one uh, things. Combining data, uh, I think we mentioned that. Uh, simply be quicker, because everyone does not need to do the same thing over and over again. And it just gives a scale, right? So it could be that uh, each individual business with the amount of data isn't huge, but then if you're able to put it all together, it gives us very good scale. The security and compliance is complex, and if we can uh, do it once and do it well, then it uh, helps us. So, uh, talking about, uh, so going by the kind of propositions that we have, we have uh, a number of different types of building blocks. So you have the, the UX part of it, uh, where you want to have a consistent look and feel. You can have building blocks in there. You can have connected devices uh, itself, the devices that we build, and the backend cloud services. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about each of these. So for the front-end building blocks, uh, to a large extent, we, we're building iOS and Android apps, uh, and also web applications. So what we do in this space is, uh, we have a concept of micro-applications. So basically what we do is uh, create composable micro-applications, uh, which actually can say, hey, they have an entry point. You say you launch this, uh, do a bunch of activities, and then you exit. And these are built completely uh, from top to bottom uh, as, a, as almost a standalone thing, which has its own context, which is completely tested there, and just works. Yeah. So what that means, you can actually, uh, if you have four different applications or solutions that need it, they can all just pick it up, put it in their application, and go, and it works. And they don't have to actually retest the basic functionality again and do it over and over again. And the uh, interesting bit here is that when we talk about a micro app, it's not just the UX bit. Uh, so if you take a typical example, user registration, right? So if you look at, if you download any application that Philips has built, there, is, there, is, uh, there are screens in there where a user can register and log in, or there are screens in there where uh, a user can actually connect, uh, hook up to his IoT device, connect it to the internet, and get the initial setup going. Now, instead of doing that again and again, what we do is build it as a micro-application. So basically, you, uh, uh, you, you build your application where you say, hey, now I want to go into registration. So you transfer control to this micro-app, uh, go through all the steps in there, and the, he does his thing, uh, uh, finishes the registration, and then hands control back to the app. Yeah? Which means that you can just reuse the whole thing again and again. So uh, the, the, the interesting bit about this is to say, if you, if you build an iOS and Android application, how have... Uh, yeah, we also have this discussion on what do we really need to do on top of what iOS and Android already deliver to, um, uh, to make micro-applications or to build applications. So there's a number of things. We need to have something like a uniform logging format, right? So if you have a number of different applications uh, who are all uh, logging some data, and if you want to make sense of it centrally, we need to define uh, good logging formats. Simply handling of configuration options. Uh, by definition, these micro apps are usable in a number of different applications, which means that they have a lot of possible configurations. And how do we define all of these configurations and manage them in one place is an interesting challenge. Determining user locale. So I, I, I was explaining to you before that a user who is uh, in France, for example, can never be routed to a data center or a cloud instance in the US. Yeah. That means that we really have to have pretty reliable ways of determining where the user's locale is. So that could be things like, yeah, do we combine his GOIP with this language, with, this, uh, uh, with the country that he has selected, and a number of other parameters. So these are all things that we have to do uh, in the mobile. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question, right? So normally the way we do that is uh, you ask the user. Uh, so we, you know that the user actually registered with a specific country, and now you detect, say with GOIP or by other means, that the user is now in a new location. So what you do then is you actually pop up something to the user saying, hey, we detect that you're in a new place. Do you actually want to uh, uh, update your settings and move the data? And if it says yes, if it's kind of permanently moved over, 
uh, then you would have to actually uh, uh, move the data to a different data center and record the fact that the user asked for it. You couldn't do it on your own, yeah? Uh, but if the user says no, then you don't do anything, but at least uh, you record the fact that you explicitly asked this user and the user chose to stay with this own uh, setup, yeah? And the, the, um, the other key challenge is uh, security, uh, as always. So when you look at the healthcare world, typically we were, uh, people were used to making completely closed systems, right? So you, uh, you, you don't, you usually don't have an open uh, 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 control of any of the things in your healthcare system. But now if you have a mobile application that are running on Android and iOS, that basically means that they're completely open, which uh, causes a lot of challenges. So uh, there are some basic things in here that we can do uh, to ensure that these things remain uh, uh, secure. So basically on Android and iOS, use key store and the keychain as much as possible. Use secure databases. So uh, in the iOS, iOS has the concept of protection classes, where basically you can say that, yeah, uh, make sure that uh, the entire database is encrypted and so on. These are things that you have to do to build medical applications. And in case of Android, uh, we use something like SQL Cipher, which can actually uh, encrypt the SQL database and provide an ORM layer on top of it so that this all uh, works. Uh, then if you go to that, that's about the front-end building blocks. Then if you start looking at the back-end, uh, there we simply use microservices. I'm not going to talk a lot about microservices. I think there's an entire track on microservices here going on, and these are, uh, uh, to be honest, Philips is not uh, the expert here. Uh, we're basically just trying to leverage uh, yeah, the best in class here and simply make use of microservices. And But the, but the main point I want to mention here is, yeah, we don't uh, try to create custom clouds or data centers. We use Amazon Web Services, we use Cloud Foundry, uh, we just use all the standard things in here. And what we need to do additionally on top is to ensure things like uh, the data stays in the right country, we use the right uh, instances of Amazon Web Services, and so on and so on. There is uh, one of the biggest challenges that we face while doing these backend services is uh, uh, the fact that we want to update microservices very, very, very often, right? Uh, so the whole idea of microservices is every couple of weeks you probably want to make a new deployment and update it and so on. But as I was explaining in the medical classification slides, every time you do an update to a medical device, you actually have to uh, completely complete a new set of documentation and file it with the specific regulatory authority, which itself is a lot of work, right? Uh, which really severely limits uh, the, uh, the speed at which we can update things. So one thing we can do there is to uh, be smart uh, about how we draw the boundaries of the medical device, right? So uh, you, can, you can, from your intended use and exactly what the application is doing, derive which parts of the system are actually medical and which are not. So if you can actually separate out uh, uh, the, for example, the rules that are doing diagnosis from the actual service that hosts it, uh, you could say that the service itself is updatable without needing big documentation changes, uh, but the rules themselves, uh, they are part of the medical device. Yeah. So this is something that you have to very carefully analyze and define. And then the, uh, the other important bit is the data model and how we store the data. We have this big ambition of having uh, data that is fully interoperable across the entire spectrum and everyone can look at um, uh, and uh, handle different data. But to be able to do that, you need to have a standard format, right? And there we are looking at a number of healthcare standards, things like FHIR, which define how to capture healthcare data. And we, are, uh, uh, we stick to that. And then we get to the devices. Typically, the devices uh, look like this. So most of the devices that we build uh, at this moment have either Wi-Fi or uh, Bluetooth built in. So we're looking at other technologies going forward, but uh, right now they tend to be Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. And, uh, uh, and what we do here uh, is we basically choose a few reference uh, uh, hardware platforms, uh, build the firmware for it, make sure that works together, and uh, make that available to various businesses to build their devices. Yeah. So, and, and we also build the Android and iOS side libraries uh, for it so that the devices can talk to these. 
again, the, blue, the profiles that we use for Bluetooth, for example, uh, we try to stick as much as possible to the uh, standard Bluetooth profiles. Uh, there are certain uh, uh, cases where if you have a complex device that does not fit into any existing profile. So for example, if I want to get uh, sensor data from a toothbrush saying which part of the mouth is brushed well or not and so on. That's something that's difficult uh, to do with standard Bluetooth profiles. In that case, we do use some custom profiles, uh, but we try to limit that as much as possible. So some of the key challenges with uh, devices that we typically see is it's extremely easy to do a denial of service attack on yourself. So I think a few years ago we had this. Devices are non-random, right? So if, any, if, if a user is to switch something on, uh, simply because all users are not the same, it's, it, it is randomized by default, it's OK. But if you program all your devices to wake up at 5 a.m. UTC every morning and check for a software update, and then if you sell a few tens of millions of those devices, then yeah, every morning you, you kind of uh, bring yourself down or you're looking at huge costs. So that's something that we need to really think about and make sure that uh, uh, we randomize that enough. And that's because IoT really scales in terms of number of devices. So if you think of uh, toothbrushes, I don't know how many millions we sell every year. And if they're all connected, yeah, this is an extremely important one. And the other thing that we spend a lot of time and effort on is BLE on Android phones, right? So Android has a stack, BLE has a standard, but still, Every phone has a slightly different chip, and every phone has a, a slightly different Bluetooth stack, and they behave really differently, and things just don't work. So we have to actually spend a lot of time making that work. And we try to do that in one place in the platform so that every, every application doesn't have to struggle with it. Let's see. And the device itself, yeah, this is, um, I won't go through all of this, but basically the idea is that we have a kind of checklist to make sure that the device itself is fully secure, and we go to a number of points uh, uh, to ensure. So, so things like firmware update, right? Sounds obvious, but if you uh, look at a number of devices, uh, they simply don't allow their firmware to be updated. So if you have a device out there and uh, if there is an issue found on it, there's nothing you can do to fix it. Uh, and if, if your firmware is updatable, how do you sign your firmware? How do you make sure it is secure? All of these guys. Okay, so now if, um, coming back to the platform bit of this, you see the building blocks at all of these levels. So the building blocks at the device level, at the app level, and uh, at the cloud level. And if, you have, uh, if we as a platform build these building blocks, and there are a number of propositions using them, you basically see that, uh, yeah, there's a huge uh, uh, combinatorial complexity. So you have different versions of devices talking to different versions of apps, talking to different versions of the cloud backend. And it really, it's, it's extremely important that we kind of understand how this is all going, who is talking to who, and uh, uh, maintain the API compatibility and so on. So the biggest amount of the uh, work and effort that we do is largely around this area to ensure that our API stay backwards compatible, that we can uh, still support a certain number of devices. And we also have to be explicitly clear. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, exactly. So that's what I was getting to. So what we need to do is we need to have very well-defined lifecycle management to say, hey, these are the versions that we support on uh, for, for these uh, things of the platform. And uh, we need to have uh, yeah, a huge number of integration tests automated running every night, whatever, to ensure that these, these things are continuously working, right? Otherwise, there's simply no way. Uh, and again, that's... Uh, Something we also learned the hard way, you can do one or two things manually, even if it's just a couple of days or whatever, but the moment you have 10 different versions and 10 different countries and so on, it just explodes and there's no way you can handle it. Yeah? And um, yeah, I think it also feels uh, funny to say a number of these uh, things in a conference like this one, right? Because I think if you really look at the software world, things like continuous integration and uh, continuous testing are all obvious. But then if you really go into enterprise and pure healthcare, a lot of this is new stuff. So basically, wh what you see happening here is that every, every company is turning into a software company, right? And every company needs to turn into a software company and needs to embrace the state of the art on all of this. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. And I think whoever does that well 
Todd is the one that's going to serve it. Yeah? So with that, uh, a bit of a conclusion on having done all of this. Uh, so does it always say make sense to build a platform? Uh, the reason I asked the question is uh, if, if you look at the previous one, uh, the, the, the compatibility and the uh, things that you need to do around it, it takes a pretty uh, uh, high amount of effort to get this running on a platform. So if you need to make a change uh, uh, for a certain feature, you have to ensure that all everything stays backwards compatible. You have to ensure that all the things that are working on your platform stay working, which actually makes that a more expensive change compared to something that you could do just in a solution, right? So that's a trade-off that we always have to think about. Um, always make sure that we've uh, thought about it enough that it really makes sense to spend the effort to put something in a platform and only do that if it makes sense. And the other thing that we do that helps us a lot is the harvesting bit. So what we try to do is if, if there is a feature that is really needed by one solution, but it's interesting for the platform, just go ahead and build it in the solution, do it quick, learn, mature it, and at a certain point you can always harvest it out of the, out of the solution back into the platform. And, and then it, it takes a bit of effort to make it general enough and so on, uh, but at least you have uh, You've exercised the feature, matured it, and you understand exactly how it needs to work. Yeah? So, yeah, that's uh, mostly what I had. So, 